Well, it's good to be in church on Sunday night. Hey, oh, that was so much better than this morning. So much better. Hey, but it was still just a little weak, to be perfectly honest, don't you think? Just a little bit. Let's just try one more time. It's good to be in church on Sunday night. Amen. Amen. That was so much better. Hey, we are looking forward to, listen, this is already Sunday night. That means the week is nearly over. Before you know it, it'll be Wednesday night, and we only have three more nights together. So uh, invite somebody to come along with you, and you'll be glad that you did. I, I promise you'll be glad that you did, and we will have a wonderful time around the things of God. Choir, you were in fine form tonight. That was, that was just exciting. That was encouraging. And if we had been in North Carolina, there would have been people running around in circles. They would have been. <laughs> That's just what they do down there. Amen. And uh, that, was, that was really good. Thank you so much for that wonderful truth. It's good just to be determined to serve God. Amen. Amen. No matter what, sometimes you just have to say, that's what I'm going to do. No matter what else happens. Take your Bible tonight, if you would, and open it to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. When you find that, would you stand with me? As we read the word of God, Philippians chapter number two, beginning in verse number one tonight, it says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good day that you've given to us. Thank you that you are indeed good to us all the time. And Lord, tonight I pray that as we look into your word, you'll use it in our hearts and lives. God, make whatever changes need to be made. Open our, our hearts and open our ears so that we can be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. Well, thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Here in the, the book of Philippians, uh, the Apostle Paul is the human author writing specifically to the church at Philippi. Now, I will probably somewhere along the line say... Paul said this or Paul wrote that, but you understand what I mean when I say that. Uh, sometimes we use that terminology. What's important here is not that Paul wrote it down. The important thing is not that Paul said it. The important thing is that God said it. And God gave him the words to write. Yes, he was the human instrument God used to put them down there. But if this was just a letter from Paul, it would only have historical significance. But this is the word of God from, through the Apostle Paul, from God to a specific church, and then God saw fit to preserve it so that it would not only affect them, but it would affect us all these years down the line, and all those who've been between us and the church at Philippi, and all those who will come after. And if it was important for the church at Philippi, I promise you it's important for the church in Cleveland. Amen. It is. God saved it and preserved it there for us so that we can not just learn historical things about them, but so that he can teach us things right now about our walk with God. And so here's the church at Philippi. They are, as I mentioned to you this morning, they're a group of persecuted people. They're under the auspices of the Roman Empire. Nero is the emperor and he's a wicked, wicked man. He, through his own foolishness, is destroying his, his government, his empire. And as politicians do, he wants to find someone else to blame for it. He's not going to stand up and say, I'm the one who's ruining the empire. He's got to find somebody else to blame. And the perfect, perfect object of his scorn is this group of people called Christians. Because they've made a, a, a big point of standing up and saying there's only one God. And yet Nero claims he should be worshipped as a God. And they've stood up and said there's only one God and it's not him. Amen. 
And so there's automatic uh, difficulty there in that situation. And so now he says, they're the reason. They're the ones. They've caused all the trouble. And so by the time we get to the book of Philippians, bad things are happening to Christians. They're being hunted down. They're being thrown into the Colosseum and beaten to death by gladiators. And they're being ripped apart by wild animals. And, and they're being taken out of their homes and slaughtered and put on pikes and covered with pitch and tar and lit on fire to light the streets of Rome at night. It's not an easy time to live. And yet all through the little book of Philippians, you find two themes over and over. The first one is rejoicing. I mean, just rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoice, 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 from the beginning to the end, rejoicing. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? And not only rejoicing, but looking ahead to what God has prepared for them, because sometimes it's not till things get uncomfortable here that we remember the old song, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are somewhere else. Amen? And so there's that theme of rejoicing, and then that theme of looking ahead to what God has prepared for for us. And in the middle of, uh, of all of this, chapter one is a phenomenal chapter, wonderful chapter. Chapter three and chapter four, amazing chapters. And right in the middle of it comes chapter two. And look again at the, at the first verse of chapter two. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. Now, as the Apostle Paul is writing in the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he says, now, folks at Philippi, here's what will make me happy. Here's what will bring me joy. Here's how you can fulfill my joy. You can make me a happy person. Now, if you were, if you were writing a letter to dear friends who were being persecuted, who were having trouble, what would you say to them? Here's what would make me happy. That, that the persecution stops? That, that uh, Rome will take a different view of Christianity and you'll be able to go about your lives without so much difficulty, without so much trouble? That's probably what would be at the top of our list. That God would keep you safe. That God would keep you well. But that's one other thing you learn in the book of Philippians is that God's priorities are quite often different than ours. Amen. And you've probably learned that in your own life. God seems to have a whole different set of priorities than we do. What he says is, fulfill ye my joy. Here's, here's what will give me joy and make me happy. That ye be like-minded. I, I would dare say if we were making a list of things that we, we desire that would make us happy when we're talking about people who are our friends who are in trouble, that probably wouldn't even make it on the list. It'd probably be way down at the bottom somewhere under all kinds of other things. And yet God puts it right at the top. He says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. I want to preach to you tonight on this subject, the importance of unity. The importance of unity. Now, if God thought it was important to speak to the church at Philippi about unity... And you can read through Philippians and other passages where things there are mentioned. The church at Philippi is not a church that's plagued with awful trouble. Oh, they have, uh, they have a few folks that don't want to serve God. And they have a few uh, issues here and there. But they're, they're not in a terrible mess. They're doing all right. They're doing okay. And yet God found the, the importance in saying to them, here's what you really need. You need to work together in Unity. Now, again, if that was true for the church at Philippi, I promise you it's true for the church at Cleveland. Amen. It's just as true today. You say, well, why would that be an issue for this group of people sitting there in Philippi? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they're just like you. They are. They're, they're just like me. You look around you tonight and you see all these people sitting here and those folks up in the balcony and, you know, everybody's, they, they've combed their hair and they've washed their face and, and they put their, their tie on and, they, you know, they're dressed up for church and, and everybody looks good. But you know and I know that we are very, very different. We are. I mean, here we are all sitting in the same church. I would assume most of you probably members of this church. And yet you have very, very different backgrounds. You have very, very different stories that you brought in here with you. You came from different places. 
Some of you came from places where there were, there were a lot of material things and wealth. Some of you came from places where there was absolutely nothing. Some of you came from one political perspective and some came from another. Some came with all kinds of education and some came with none. But we all have one wonderful thing in common. We know the same Savior. And so here we are sitting in the same room with all those differences and all those different backgrounds and stories. And now you see why God would say, while you're at it, let's make sure we work together. Because the natural course of events would be that we just blow apart and we all go our different directions. And yet God says, we need to work together. He says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. I believe if you could peek in the windows at the church at Philippi, that you'd see how much like us they are or how much like them we are. And the truth is, you probably know some of these folks. You do. You know them. Turn in your Bible, if you would, back to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter number 16. Look, if you would, at verse number 12. The Apostle Paul is on a missionary journey. <clears throat> And he's coming through, and we'll pick up the narrative there in verse number 12. It says, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So here's Paul and, and his group of people traveling with him. And, and they go down there by the river on the Sabbath. And there's a group of ladies down there, and they are sincere ladies who love God. Now, notice, I didn't say they're saved. They're sincere, and they love God. You need to understand, there are a whole lot of sincere people who have an affection for God, but they're lost. And they need to know Jesus Christ. And so they meet these ladies, look at verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She's one of those ladies down there, and, and she hears what Paul is saying. Paul takes the opportunity, while these ladies are all congregated in one spot, and they love God, and they're worshiping God, and he says, let me tell you something you don't know about God this far. That he sent his son, and his son died for you, and paid the penalty for your sin, and you can have a relationship with him. And Lydia heard it, and she listened, and she said, that's exactly what I've been looking for. And Lydia gets saved and she gets baptized and then they go back to her house and eat because they're good Baptist folks. Amen. That's, hey, that's what we do. Amen. <laughs> we don't drink and smoke and dance all. We do eat though. We eat when we're happy. We eat when we're sad. If we're not sure if we're supposed to be happy or sad, we meet together and talk about it and bring finger food. That's what we do. I mean, we, we, if we get together, the first thing you do when you walk in the room is look for the coffee pot and the food. That's what you do. It's just because that's how we do it. Amen. Uh, it's a good Bible principle right there. That's how they did it. She said, come back to the house. And, and they went back and they ate. I believe if you peeked in the windows at the church at Philippi, you'd see a, a, a whole family filling up a whole pew and they'd be very nicely dressed. You see, Lydia is a seller of purple. And purple wasn't just a color. Purple was a status symbol. Purple was a hard color to make because you had to have just the right things and only the wealthy people who could afford something special had purple. Royalty had purple. Very wealthy people had purple and those are the customers of Lydia. So she's done very well for herself in her business. She's, she's well off. She does fine. Her whole family's sitting there in the pew. They're nicely dressed. They're sitting there in the church at Philippi. Isn't that exciting? There they are, the whole crew. But the story doesn't stop there. Look what happens over here in the next verse. Verse number 16, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsayings. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. 
But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when the masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. Here's this, here's this street person. She's lived on the street all of her life. She has no family. She has nothing. And she's possessed by devils. And because of that, she, she does what, what we'd call today fortune telling. And these wicked men, these wicked men are using her to tell fortunes for people. And then they're taking the money. She's still not getting anything from it. They're just using her. And there she is in the street with nothing, possessed of devils, abused by people all of her life. And then all of a sudden one day, the devils are gone. I believe if you peek in the church at Philippi, over here you, you'd see a, a rough looking girl. Oh, oh she's, she's cleaned up because she went down to Goodwill and she got some clothes. And, and there she is, and they don't really match, and they don't really fit that well, but she's so pleased to be sitting there in clothes, and she's sitting there in church, and she's got her hair combed, and, and there's Lydia's family, all well-dressed and well-educated, and here's this girl with nothing and nobody but sitting there. Well, they get hauled before the magistrates, and, and you know what happens. Paul and Silas end up getting thrown in jail. Look, if you would, down at verse number, uh, verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried and said with a loud voice, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Join the church and get baptized and do the best you can. Oh, no, no, that's a different version, isn't it? And they said, verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And they ate again. Amen. They ate again. It's a Bible principle, I'm telling you. By the way, if you read down the end of the chapter, you know where the chapter ends? They're back at Lydia's house eating again. That's what they're doing. You peek in the windows of the church at Philippi and there's, there's that nicely dressed family. There's that rough looking girl. And then back over here, there's, there's just kind of a middle class family. And they're all sitting there and they all have the same big old smile on their faces. Because they all just met Jesus. Amen. And they have nothing in common. Nothing. I mean, Lydia, is a, she's a businesswoman. She's an entrepreneur. The, the, the uh, jailer and his family, he's a government employee, for goodness sake. She has nothing to do with him. He has nothing to do with her. Neither one of them have anything to do with this girl from off the street. And she doesn't have anything to do with them. And they only have one thing in common now. But it's enough to get past all of that. Because they've met the Savior. And now they're sitting. Can you see why God would say, here's what you need to do. Be of one mind. Be of one accord. I want you to work together. You see, they're just like us. Some of you would relate to one or more of those backgrounds in this room tonight. And you could say, that's just like me. I was just like that. That's what our family was always like. And yet here we are. Thank God for it. Amen. And God says, now I want you to work together in unity. How do you do that? Well, turn back to Philippians chapter 2. First of all, we see the goal of unity. It says, fulfill ye my joy, in verse 2, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. The goal is unity. Of course, that you have the same love. Now, the world has taken the term love today and twisted it into something perverse and weird. 
and they tell you that, that love means that you don't even understand reality and truth. You just throw out this blanket acceptance of everything and everyone and every idea, and that's real love. That's not God's love. God's love determines between right and wrong and good and evil. God, God's love is the kind of love he's talking about here. Having the same love, a love that's based on Bible truth. First of all, a love for the Savior and a love for his work and his people. He says being of, having the same love. If you don't have the same love, you don't have unity. You can't have it. And then he says being of one accord. What does it mean to be of one accord? Well, it means to have the same direction and the same purpose. If you don't have the same direction and same purpose, you can't work together. You've got to be moving the same direction or everything comes apart. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Oh, there's, there's different things, but they all have the same purpose. And that purpose is the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. Listen, you don't get to have your own personal agenda in the service of God. God wants us to work together in unity. And that might mean that you have a preference that's different than someone else's preference. But there are times where you have to stay back and say, okay, that's what I prefer, but I'm most certainly not going to destroy the unity over that preference. I'm going to work together with what the church is doing. Listen, if every time the preacher stands up and says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this project or this thing, or, or, or we're going to have this class. And you're the one who says, well, that's a dumb idea. First of all, keep it to yourself. Amen. And secondly, if you find that you're always the one that's reacting negatively to whatever's going on, the problem is most likely not everybody else. It's probably you, amen? <laughs> it's the way that works. You ought to just go home and look in the mirror and say, why is it that every time the preacher announces something, I have this reaction? And then you probably should just get right with God. Amen. That's just a suggestion, Amen. He didn't tell me to say that, but, you know, that's, that's the truth. Don't take great pride in the fact that you know more than everybody else. Amen. Don't do that. Because there are times where you're going to have to subject your will to someone else in order to serve God together. God wants us to serve him together not all apart and separately and individually. Yes, we serve him individually, but corporately we need to serve him together. One accord of one mind. How do you have one mind? Well, you have to have the same philosophy and the same basis for truth. And the only one that'll work is that book right there. You have to go back to that and say, okay, here's why we do this because of what the Word of God has to say. And then you simply submit yourself to the Word of God. If you don't have the same basis for truth, you will never be of one mind. You simply can't be. I was talking to a man, well now it's been a year and a half, nearly two years ago, we were out in California, and this man came to me after the service and he wanted to talk and I knew that he was not saved and and I thought that's what he wanted to talk about. What he really wanted to do was try to convince me that his religion was good enough. And he was going to heaven because he was a good person and he worked hard. And after all, salvation is based on works and on and on it went. And finally I said, and I'd give him Bible verses and he'd say, well, the church teaches. And I'd give him another Bible verse and he'd say, well, our tradition says, and, but the priest says this and on and on. I said, okay. After, I don't know how long, an hour, two hours of wasting my time, I said, the problem is we, <laughs> we can't agree on a basis for truth here. Amen. My basis for truth is the word of God. Amen. Your basis for truth is something else. And so we'll never come to the same conclusions. You've you got to have the same basis for truth or you'll never come up with the same answers. And if one guy's basis for truth is his emotions and how he feels, 
And the other guy's basis for truth is what he saw on the news last week. And the other one's basis for truth is from the political propaganda he got in the mail a month ago. And on and on and on. We'll never agree on anything. We've got to, we just got to forget all that and go back to the Bible and say, what does God have to say? That's the basis for truth. And whatever he says is right and everything else is just wrong. We were in a missions conference long, long ago, far, far away. Far, far away. Well, I guess it wasn't that far, but it was, <laughs> it was a long time ago now. And, and I, would, I would preach the message every night, and, and uh, a missionary would present their work. They would do that first, and I would preach. And then one night, we did it backwards. I preached first, and then the missionary was going to present uh, his, his ministry because there was a lady missionary who was going to talk to all the ladies downstairs. So I finished preaching that night. I sat down on the front row and all the ladies got up and headed downstairs, except for one lady. She came in, she, she walked up, she sat down next to me on the front row. Brother Folger, that made me a little nervous because that's just not, you know, that's just not normal. And so she sat down there next to me on the front row. And she said, Brother Rogers, did I understand you to say that people who do not hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and trust Jesus Christ as Savior will die and go to hell? I said, yes, ma'am, that's exactly what I said. She said, well, the God that I know wouldn't send people to hell just because they hadn't heard the gospel. What I wanted to say was, what God do you know? But I didn't say that. That would have been inappropriate. Instead, I said, ma'am, do you believe the Bible? She said, oh, yes, I believe the Bible. <laughs> I said, well, then, I recommend you go home and read Romans chapter 1. Because Romans chapter 1 will answer the question. It's not a dumb question. It's a perfectly logical question. Would God send people to hell who have never heard the gospel? It's a good question. It's such a good question. He takes a whole chapter and answers it. I said, go home and read Romans chapter 1, and it will answer your question. And she said, but I just don't think that God would do that. I said, ma'am, please go home and read Romans chapter 1. It'll answer the question. By this time, all the ladies are gone, the missionary's ready, and everybody's watching us. And, she, and then she started to cry. She's getting louder, and now she's crying. That's not fair. And, and, and she said, but I just don't. And I said, ma'am... I, even if you don't read Romans chapter 1, just go home. Amen. I just, and I didn't say that. I wanted to. It wouldn't have been appropriate. I said, I said <laughs> please, ma'am, just really, if, if you just go home and read Romans chapter 1, it'll answer your question. Amen. And she got up and headed down the aisle, and everybody's watching. And the, the lady missionary saw what was going on, and she had stayed in the back instead of going downstairs. And she caught her and talked to her in the back a little bit. You, you know what that woman's problem was? It wasn't that she was an evil, wicked person. It's that she didn't submit herself to that as the basis for truth. Amen. Her basis for truth was what she felt and her emotions. And if your emotions are your basis for truth, you don't have any truth. Because it'll change from day to day. It'll come and it'll go, but this never does. You can make that your foundation and your basis for truth. And if we all do that, we can be of one mind. Because we'll have the same basis and the same philosophy. He said being of one accord and of one mind. That's the goal. But then he gives us the hindrances to unity. Look, if you would, at verse number three. Here's how you get rid of it. Here's how you do away with unity altogether. Let nothing be done through strife. Or vain glory. You, you want to you get rid of unity? You allow strife and vain glory to come on the scene. Strife. You know, always, always just fighting and fussing and demanding your own way. I remember as a little kid sitting in the, the church I got saved in, and, and it was a little of a, a little different stripe. And they, they had business meetings every month. I mean like clockwork. Business meetings every month. That's a tragic mistake. Because <laughs> things can go bad real fast. And I remember sitting there as a little kid in that church, seeing my Sunday school teacher, who I respected immensely, stand up and say awful things to my pastor, who I respected immensely. 
and the deacon get up and, and say horrible things about the preacher and, and the, on and I, I sat there and watched that in those reprehensible business meetings. And it's only the grace of God that I'm still in church today, amen? amen. I, I promise you there are people who are not who sit through that kind of garbage, yes. who just wash their hands of the whole mess and walk away. Yes. What was the problem? Strife, strife. They ended up booting out the preacher and, and I'll be honest with you, he never did a single thing wrong. It's just that it was a personality thing. And they didn't like his laid back style of what he did. And, and it was just wicked, wicked and vile is what it was. Strife. You want to destroy unity? You want to ruin what God's trying to do in Cleveland, Ohio? Well, then you just let strife make its way in. Then it says in vainglory. Really, that's just pride. That's what that is. When you stand up and say, I know better than they do, and I'm going to have it my way, and if I don't get it, there's going to be trouble. But don't ever be that guy. Don't do that. They're, they're going to put in new carpet. It's going to be the carpet I want, or they'll put it in over my dead body. I think it's a good plan. Put it in over the dead body. There will be a lump there for a few months, but if you stomp on it every time you go by, pretty soon it'll go down. Ponder that for a minute. <laughs> Listen, if you find yourself, none of us are, are impervious to that. We all feel that rise up in us somewhere along the line at some point. But when it does, you better shove it back down and say, God, get that wickedness out of my life. Get that vainglory and that pride out of here because that's going to ruin what God is trying to do. Why in the world would you ruin the work of God over the color of carpet? or over the lights that are hanging in the building, or over the color you paint the wall, or, well, I like this pulpit, and if they ever change that pulpit, I'm out of here, well, then shame on you. Shame on you. That's nothing but pride. Vain glory. You, you want to ruin what God's doing? Just allow that to come into your, into your church. And it'll absolutely destroy it. The hindrances to unity. You see, it's important to God, but it's easy. Easy to destroy. But then he gives us the means of unity. Here's how you accomplish it. Look, if you would, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, <clears throat> let each esteem other better than themselves. Amen. That's how you do it. Now, remember, this is, this is a letter being given by God through the Apostle Paul to a very specific group of people, the church at Philippi. I mean, they know who they are. When, when these words are being read and they gather together and whoever gets to read it out loud is standing up in front and reading it and saying, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. I promise you there are people looking around and saying, I know who he's talking about. <laughs> yep, I, I know who it is because it's going to a very specific group of people. If somebody wrote a letter like that to you and your pastor stood up and read it next Sunday and it said, you know, we had such a wonderful time there at Cleveland and, and uh, so-and-so was so kind and, and then we ran into somebody who said this, nobody would have to tell you who it was. You would know who it was. It's the person who says that to everybody. So they know who's, who's being mentioned here. They know, we don't, but they know. And they're thinking, mm-hmm, I, I know who it is. And then he gets down there and says, let each esteem other better than themselves. Amen. They still know who he's talking about. Because this is not, a, as when they're reading it, this is not a letter to people thousands of years ago. This is a letter to them from God. And so... As Lydia looks down at the girl from off the street, the words are being read. And it says, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. God is very literally saying, Lydia, don't forget, she's better than you are. That's what's said right there. And that girl who's sitting there, who's always been a little bitter, at the jailer and his family because she spent most of her life in and out of his jail and he was never very nice to her because she was nothing but trouble. 
God is saying to her, don't forget, girl from off the street. The jailer back there, he's, he's, he's better than you. That's a hard pill to swallow. And to the jailer who's sitting back there, who never has very much liked Lydia and her family because they're on opposite ends of the political and social spectrum and he's always just kind of had not much to do with them and they've had not much to do with him. God is saying to him, don't forget when you look over there at Lydia and her family, they're better than you, Mr. Jailer. And to Lydia, he says, don't, don't forget the jailer's better than you are too. And he says to the girl, don't forget Lydia's better than you are and her family. And the truth is, if we all do that, then none of us will be trying to step on somebody else to get our way. Amen. I mean, Lydia and her family can say, you know, we'll take care of everything that's going on. We know what to do. We know how to run things. She doesn't know anything. He's a government employee, so you know he doesn't know anything. We... We'll handle this. And God has to say to her, don't forget. They're better than you are. And he has to say to them, don't forget. They're better than you are. And he has to say to her, don't forget. They're all better than you are. And as long as we all think everybody else is better than us, we'll work together. Amen. We won't take advantage of each other. Right. You see, if this, if this letter were to Cleveland Baptist Church... You'd be reading it, and God would be saying, don't forget now, he's more important than you are. Oh, but he's just a kid. So... No, oh, he's more important than you are. You better be careful how you live and how you act and how you conduct yourself, because he's watching you, and he's important. Don't, don't forget, young man, she's more important than you are. Oh, but she, she's more important than you are. Don't forget, they're more important than you, and, and you're more important than... And as long as you just have yourself convinced that everybody else is more important, you'll, be, you'll think of them a whole lot different. You'll conduct yourself differently. Let each esteem other better than themselves, and then look at the very end of it there. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You esteem others better than yourselves, and then you look out for the spiritual well-being of others. Sometimes people make the tragic mistake of discounting little children and young people because they're messy. And you know, you know you've run buses forever. When you, when you bring in buses full of little kids, you got a mess on your hands. You do. That's the truth. They're a mess. But some of those little kids get saved. And some of you might well have been some of those little kids along the line. And now here you sit. And I promise you, there are people on mission fields and standing behind pulpits tonight who were one day little snotty-nosed kids that somebody brought to Sunday school somewhere. And somebody gave them the gospel and they got saved and their life was changed. We, so much of quote unquote Christianity today is focused on me and what I'm getting out of it. And I need this and I need that and I want this and I want. What a wicked perspective. Instead it ought to be, Lord, how can I be an encouragement to that little kid? Because who knows but what that little kid might one day end up on a mission field preaching the gospel to people I'll never meet. I better encourage that kid because I don't know what God's going to do in his life and how he's going to be used in the work of God. I better look on the things of others rather than things of myself. Amen. And if we can all do that, you'll be surprised how we could work together for the cause of Christ. Amen. How is it that this church supports missionaries all over the world? How is that? I'll tell you how. Because you work together to do that. There's not a single one of us in this room tonight that could support all those missionaries. But together, we can do that. Amen. We can do great things for the cause of Christ. There's not a single one of us who by themselves could just finance sending buses out all over and bringing in little kids. But together, you can do that. You can do great things for God together. If you'll work together. 
say, well, that's, that's a strange message to preach for a revival meeting. I don't think so. Because I would guess on this Sunday night, well, we could spend the night preaching on drunkenness and immorality and, you know, all manner of stuff. But most of you are not doing that. You know what you're more likely to be doing? <laughs> Strife and vainglory. And that'll kill revival faster than drunkenness and immorality will. Because it infects the body and it destroys the work of God. And if we really want to see God do something exciting. Listen, we live in exciting times. Amen. We do. Oh, uncertain. Certainly uncertain times. Because we have no idea what's gonna, what bombshell is going to hit us next week. We have no idea. We just have no, no clue. And it's a good thing because we'd be scared to death. But these are exciting times. We just, we just had some, some peace treaties signed between Israel and Arab countries. So that's just some political stunt. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. God's doing some stuff. Amen. Things are happening around the world. All of a sudden, just after the whole COVID thing broke out, we were hearing people on the news saying, well, what we really need is a global response. We need a worldwide global response to take care of all this. Well, isn't that convenient? Because one day we'll have a worldwide global government. Who's going to administer the global response but the global government? And that stuff all happens at the end of the story. You know what that all tells you? The end is coming. Amen. You remember, I remember when I was a kid, you'd see people out pictures of them on the, on the street corner. The end is near. Oh, they had no idea. The end is near. Amen? Amen. And it just might be that God would allow us to see some people saved before the whole thing is out. Yeah. That'd be just like God to do that, don't you think? Amen. That he'd allow a whole bunch of folks to get saved before it all, all winds down. I, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if God would do that. I'd sure want to be ready to be part of that, wouldn't you? Amen. That means we've got to work together in unity. This is not the time to go your own way and, and leave the church and split. And, uh, this is not the time for that. This is the time to jump in together and see what God can do with you in the short time we have remaining. Because someday the trumpet's going to blow. It'll blow. Amen. And you won't have to worry about whether the snotty-nosed bus kids messed up the carpet or not. All you'll be doing is rejoicing over the ones that got saved Amen. and got to heaven with you. If we can work together. That, of course, means you need to be saved. Amen. Amen. If you're here tonight, you don't know Christ as Savior. I'm telling you, the end is near. And you better get ready. If you're saved, you ought to get excited. Amen. Say, God, how are you going to use me in these last few years? to do something great and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ in a wicked, wicked world. But we have to do it together. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we could be here tonight. Thank you for your goodness to us and your mercy. Lord, thank you for letting us visit the church at Philippi and see people just like us having a hard time, just like some folks here are having a hard time. Folks who are a little nervous about the future, not sure what's going on. And yet you told them to rejoice. You told them to look ahead to what you have waiting. And you told them to be like-minded. God, if that was important for them, oh, how important is it for us today? Help us to be like-minded so that we can do everything for you that we need to do in these last days. God, again, if there's one here tonight who's never trusted Christ as Savior, I pray that tonight they would understand this world is not going to be around forever. Its time is short, and their time is short, and they need to get saved before it's too late. Well, thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name.